LinkedIn presents. How does the attachment style that you formed in childhood affect how you work? I'm Maura Ahrens Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work and asks, how can we all do both better? The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by SAP. Harness the power of AI across your business and achieve results that are relevant, reliable, and responsible with SAP Business AI. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. If you've ever taken Psychology 101, you surely remember Harry Harlow's experiment with baby monkeys. This was the experiment in which monkeys chose a cloth mom who they could touch over a wire mother stand-in who fed them. The monkeys craved the soft presence of a parent figure so much, they chose it over food. That experiment always makes me cry if I watch it on YouTube. Today, we're gonna talk about attachment, attachment style, and how It shapes us in our careers, how it affects us at work. It's funny, this has been a topic that you have requested over the years. Attachment theory highlights the significance of a consistent, responsive, and emotionally attuned parent or caregiver when we're young. Our relationship to our caregiver when we're little has profound effects for how we are as adults. For the purposes of today, what we should remember are the major buckets of attachment styles as we apply them to humans, secure, anxious, and avoidant. We'll talk more about these styles with my guest, Jack Hinman. He's the founder and executive director of Engage Transitions. But more importantly, he's gonna talk about how these styles get developed and what they mean for the world of work. Here's our conversation. You sent me over a document that was called Superpowers Cheat Sheet, Attachment Style. And I was raised, like a lot of us, to think attachment is binary. You're, you're securely attached. You're insecurely attached. It's your mother's fault. She was good enough. You know, classic Winnicott. And what this Superpowers document tells me is that it's way deeper than that. And there's no bad attachment style that even those of us who are anxious or preoccupied have superpowers. And I wanted you to share some of those and bring us into a more sort of 2024 version of how we look at attachment styles. The way I conceptualize attachment is that it's our operating system. It's our relationship operating system. It's a way for you to really understand the stress you feel in relationships and how you respond to that stress. So that translates into every aspect of our life. I mean, when you think about it, what is life about? It's about connection. It's about relationships. And so, of course, that kind of moves into the work environment where we're interacting with people, we're managing people, we're supervising people. So the stress we feel in relationships and how we deal with that stress goes directly back to our attachment. And also, too, it's really important to think about attachment. There's different attachment styles, and there's four different ones. And it's really important to conceptualize them not as like a label or as a diagnosis or pathological. Attachment is on a continuum. And so we also have different kinds of attachment, different kinds of people in our personal life, our work life, with our kids, and so on. It's on a continuum. And it's really, really based on anxiety and avoidance. Trust and autonomy. There's those the different spheres and different areas you fall into. Like it's not binary, it's not black and white, it's on a continuum. And also, too, it's really important to understand is that we used to think about attachment being locked like in stone. It's like once you have your attachment style, you're set for life, you can't do anything about it. And, and the reality is that our relationship operating system, which is our attachment style, is always evolving, it's always updating. And the reality is it goes both ways. You could have grown up in a very disorganized, unhealthy family system and developed anxious attachment, but then do the work in your life and the relationships and connections you have, you can really shift your attachment into a more secure place. And it can be also be the opposite. You could have grown up in a really secure environment and have like kind of your typical secure attachment, 
but then something really traumatic in your life happening that can really rock your attachment style. It can rock your relationship operating system and shift you into a very in- insecure place. It could be a death of a child. It could be a really mm-hmm. damaging marriage and a really difficult divorce you went through that can really move in that space. So it's always flowing, ever going back and forth. The ground coming out from under you in any way, even at work, I would imagine, if you're someone who identifies a lot with work, could shift that. Yeah. You, like, think about it. How much is our identity based on, like, our jobs? Mm, a lot. Like, 70%. For a lot of us. Yeah. I think I, I think I read, I read a stat is that when we are kind of, like, introducing ourselves or connecting with people, we lead into the place, like, where do we work at? So it's such a huge part of, like, our identity and a part of ourself. And so the way we manage relationships and our attachment style is going to directly impact the work environment. And if you look at research for people who are successful in their business careers, they're the connectors. People who know how to connect, keep and maintain relationships are the ones that are the most successful in their jobs. Then you draw the line to that. So of course your attachment style is going to directly impact your professional success. Okay. So let me ask a question here. Of course, I'm drawn to what is known as the anxious attachment style, preoccupied attachment style. Are we able to connect? Are we damaged? So I want to just really quickly talk about the three main types of attachment styles and in this context of yes. conversation, which I think will help help this conversation. There's really four of them. So secure is like you're secure. Then there is the preoccupied, which we call the anxious type in a sense, but it's called preoccupied type. You don't like calling it anxious, right? You you don't like insecure or anxious. I've heard you say that. You just- yeah, I don't like it because anxious also falls into the category of avoidant. Like people who have mm. avoidant attachment style also have anxious attachment style. So preoccupied and avoidant really have anxious attachment style. It's just different how it plays out. And also it's different of like what their anxiety they're experiencing and how they manage it. So there's preoccupied. So a preoccupied person like you really lean into relationships. Like we crave relationships. We want that connection. We're very vigilant about relationships. We're the person that's always texting our friends and saying contact. We're like the glue in relationships. <laughs> like, and so we're really like driven in that space. And we also feel a high degree of anxiety when we feel disconnected. That's the anxious or which is I like to call preoccupied type. And then you have the disorganized type, which is more of a combination of like preoccupied and anxious. Before this conversation today, we're really going to stay focused on secure, like preoccupied and also avoidant today. We're going to not focus on disorganized. Yeah. I mean, we could. So disorganized is a, it's a combination of like a preoccupied and also avoidant. Usually people who are in the space of disorganized attachment style had a significant history of trauma, maybe as a disorganized person or being in a relationship with a disorganized person, it's that kind of push and pull piece where they so desperately want connection, so desperately want intimacy. But then when they drive into relationships, they get super anxious about the connection and they pull back and they get overwhelmed with that connection. And then when they pull back with that connection, then they get anxious not being connected. So they're kind of going back and forth, back and forth in that relationship. So secure, avoidant, and preoccupied. Yes. And it's great to kind of conceptualize how those different attachment styles play out like in relationships, specifically in a work setting. It's also important to look at from an attachment standpoint, what kind of attachment style does your boss have? And I think it's really helpful to kind of be aware of your attachment style and be aware of like your attachment style and your teams so that you know how to manage relationships. You might be supervising like a preoccupied attachment, like kind of supervisee and being aware of that style you're going to be mindful that they really crave connection. They really want feedback. So even like how you manage your one-on-ones is really important to understand the attachment style of you and also the attachment style of the person you're supervising. So a preoccupied person, you probably want to be really consistent about your one-on-ones. You want to give lots of feedback because they're really driven by feedback. They're wanting to grow. They're like, they're just craving that connection with you as a supervisor. Because they are very relational. They have to see how they are. They exist in relation to other people, right? 100%. They crave intimacy. They crave connection. And when there's a disconnect, that's when their anxiety shoots through the roof. Then that's where we kind of like start getting preoccupied. We start spiraling. For example, let's say you're at work and you're a preoccupied supervisee 
and your your boss walks in and completely doesn't even say hi to you that morning. Goes straight to their office and shuts their door. So what is a preoccupied person going to automatically think? <laughs> they hate me. I I messed up. I'm getting fired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like what what did I do? Yeah, exactly. You go right into that space because a preoccupied person really owns the relationship, really owns the connection. So what's really helpful for that boss is like to be aware of like the patterns around them and the people around them. And also that preoccupied person who experienced their boss going straight through their door and shutting their their door, their preoccupied person should sit there and go, okay, I'm feeling super anxious right now. I'm feeling very anxious about my relationship with my boss. And you can kind of catch yourself, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, Jack, remember, you have a tendency to fall into that preoccupied space. You start really understanding the anxiety that you're experiencing in the workplace with your colleagues. So imagine having an avoidant boss and a preoccupied supervisee. Imagine what that dynamic's like. I think some definitions would be helpful here so that folks can sort of start thinking about, and obviously one podcast is not meant to diagnose anyone, but I would love you to just talk through some some key characteristics or way that you might start examining your own style. Let's start with avoidant style. Give us some some ways that this might show up and ways that you can start thinking about your own. Yeah, I think the thing is that with with an avoidant kind of person who falls in that kind of space, remember we're on a continuum and it also our attached styles can show up differently with different people in different settings too. A typical avoidant person is can get kind of flooded you get overwhelmed with can, like intimacy and so what happens is that they they might shut down of like emotionally and they might really want like a less connection more disconnection in a sense they really thrive on autonomy they th- thrive on like freedom and resiliency and so typically like an avoidant person they're great in crisis they're typically they're logical they were like very crisis oriented. They like they're kind of coming up with a plan. Let's do this, and so they kind of thrive in that space. So, so they're really good at like completing tasks. They're typically more task masters than relational folks, and so they're really more oh. focused on getting stuff done in the day versus like maybe how well they connected with people and work. Probably better at feedback too, right? Or either getting feedback, they don't take it as personally. Yes or no? Actually, it's quite interesting. You think that would be the case, but reality is that people who are kind of avoidant have a tendency to like really just thrive on resiliency in a way how it connects to feedback, and they might be a little bit defensive. That this <laughs> think about it. Think in contrast to an avoidant to a preoccupied, an anxious person. An anxious person is going like, "Oh no, okay, give me feedback how how I can be better." They really care about performing well, so they want to do well. A person that's avoidant might stay in a place of being more defended and less likely to mm. feedback because they're a little more disconnected to themselves emotionally. They have that disconnect to the emotional experience, which can maybe decrease their level of insight, which impacts their like ability to receive feedback or make sense to them. Does that make sense? That really makes sense. They go to work more for like getting the task done versus for relationships and connection. And so they are more maybe less likely to like get a lot of the relationship needs from work, which means because they have maybe less needs of wanting to connect. And probably are motivated by different I always think about what's motivating people. Results. Like avoided person is really motivated by results and resiliency mm-hmm. and independence. How well can they do this on their own? So think about it. So we go back in their history, like usually a typical like person who develops an avoidant style came from an environment of like where their parents were kind of unresponsive. They weren't responding to their needs as a kid, a, a degree of neglect in a sense, maybe not like, like overt abuse, but they just weren't around. They just weren't there to provide for that child's needs. And so the way that child shaped themselves in to like protect themselves and to survive is like, I got to do it on my own. Right. And maybe it's my way or the highway because I can only depend on myself. Exactly. Yeah. Trust is an issue with people who've got a one style or maybe like trusting other people in those things as well. And and so, yeah, it's like you, when you think about attachment, you want to think about the degree of anxiety, like the, the level of anxiety, level of avoidance, level of autonomy, and level of trust. And those are the four factors that can shape the attachment style, which plays out how people manage our work life. 
secure. Is anyone secure? It, it, I used to have a cartoon <laughs> on my refrigerator that had a, it was entitled the Functional Family Convention, and it was one person standing by himself. So I guess my question is, <laughs> are there any people who are truly securely attached? I don't think so. I think it's really, like, I was being facetious, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I think the thing is that it's like it's fluid. It's extremely dynamic, and it's like floating around. And it's so funny when you when you were asking that question, my instant thought was when my wife literally said the other day, she's like, "I'm secure in this marriage, so you could be insecure." <laughs> it was like somebody's got to be insecure <laughs> in the relationship, and I just laugh. It's so true in that sense, and so yeah, I. What does she mean by that? Tell us what secure means in a relationship. Yeah, I think the thing is that where it goes to the paradox of attachment, you feel that connection, that security where you don't worry about the relationship. Mm. You can actually move away from the relationship in a healthy way where you have a sense of autonomy, sense of independence, and you feel connected at the same time. And so I would say it fall in that preoccupied space and my wife's like pretty secure and we talk about these dynamics and we're aware of these dynamics in our marriage. And so, for example, she goes to work. Like, of course, when she goes to work, she's only thinking about work. She's not sitting there and thinking about like our relationship. <laughs> and, and so for <laughs> me, I might like say we're gone in the morning. We have maybe a, like a rupture in our relationship. I will walk out the door maybe being a little too preoccupied about the relationship and it could be affecting my work performance with her. She's like, you know what? I'm good. We'll work through it. We'll talk about <laughs> it when we get home. And so they have a healthy like balance of like needing connection, but also a healthy balance of autonomy. They have a healthy balance of like being aware of the relationship, but not being too preoccupied about the relationship. So secure is kind of is in that middle of throttling or like kind of landing between avoidant and also anxious. Think about a secure boss. They're connected to you, but they're not threatened by you. They're connected to you, but they trust you. They're connected to you, but they don't micromanage you. They're connected to you. And they also want you to like grow in your professional career. They're not threatened by you. They're not like threatened by you leaving the company. They want to see you grow. And so think about like we've had like maybe secure bosses or insecure bosses and that attachment style is directly impacting well, how they manage working with you. Can you think of a time in your own life when your own preoccupied attachment style bumped up against a manager or a colleague who was a very different style? Yeah, yeah, man. I, I, I'm just thinking where like an avoidant mm. kind of boss, a supervisor in a sense where they weren't really prone to want to connect. And so then that kind of created anxiety of like me over interpreting, like, what did I do wrong? I'm always thinking about, I'm like, like, and also to that avoided person maybe is not really mindful about being connected to people in the work. So they're not doing check-ins they're not doing one-on-ones they're not maybe consistent about their meetings and those things. They're not good about giving feedback. Right. So to a person who falls into kind of the anxious preoccupied space, it's going to spike my anxiety going like, I don't know if I'm doing well on my job. So then my anxiety actually is going to increase my insecurity because I'm not getting that feedback. And so the thing is for you is to be aware of like, okay, so in reality, I've got to own that. And and so what I got to do is like, okay, maybe my boss is a little avoidant. I'm preoccupied. I need feedback. So I'm going to have to take control of this. I'm going to have to maybe take responsibility for this and maybe drive the process and not rely on my boss to do it. If I'm going to survive and do well in this job, owning the dynamic is so important in that business kind of like relationship. Owning the dynamic. Say more about what this looks like in practice. So it's first off, I think it's so important for us to be aware of what is your attachment style. And there's great tools out there to kind of take the attachment test. And so being aware of like, okay, I'm preoccupied. And so like, even like my relationship with my wife, where I'm going to be probably wanting more connection and more validation and, and needing my ego struct and being aware of how that can create stress in the relationship. And so only the dynamic means that I'm going to be pulling more in and, and being aware of like, you know what, she's secure. So she's not going to need as much as I need in that. So I have to maybe like manage my my need for that and be aware of that. And the way to only that dynamic is is actually starting to decode the feedback. And so, for example, where 
Maybe she'll give me feedback about that connection in other ways. Maybe not so overt. Maybe she'll be like, like doing things that will like support the connection. That's not saying like, Jack, you're the best. <laughs> she'll say it in other ways in her behavior. Preoccupied people, we have to kind of like decode it. And it's maybe like we're looking for those overt kind of feedback. But in reality, there's a lot of subtle feedback that the connection is secure that I have to pick up on, which means I'm owning the dynamic. Tired of AI hype without results? SAP Business AI isn't just talk. It's embedded across SAP solutions, driving immediate impact for your organization. From Jewel, your digital assistant, to AI-powered capabilities throughout the SAP portfolio, SAP Business AI helps you make confident decisions based on your own data, all while maintaining the highest security and privacy standards for growth-focused businesses. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business Business AI. Are you a mid-market enterprise navigating today's evolving business landscape? LinkedIn and HP understand the unique challenges you face, which is why HP sponsored LinkedIn's just released 2024 Mid-Market Enterprise Economy Report. The research dives into AI adoption, hybrid and remote work, and keeping human connections strong while embracing new tech. Ready to optimize your business? Download the report now at reinvent.hp.com slash 2024 business report. Okay, Jack, so I'm going to ask you a more theoretical question, but one that I think is interesting. When you think about attachment styles and how they show up at work, how does this define what you would call good leadership? How do leaders need to bring in attachment theory into their leadership? I think it's important to be self-aware, like what's driving our behavior, like developing insight and having insight into our triggers, insight into what makes us shut down or get emotional reactive. I mean, we're all emotional beings. And I think like I said, that knowing your attachment style is a really good place to start and to develop insight into your anxiety or what makes you overwhelmed or what, what are your triggers. And because once again, work, work is such an interpersonal process and work is going to pull out your patterns. Your book talks about the family system, like understanding your family system and a work is a system. It's like a little, little family system. You got people that might be the dad or the mom or the siblings. And I could tell you stories where like I was at work, me and Mike, like Mike, we were, we were both directors and we had a director we're reporting to. And we were like the siblings and he was like the dad. And it was like interesting where the patterns played out where I was the bad kid and he was the good kid. And it made him look like the good kid more. And he got more attention and more accolades from the boss. We talked about that pattern quite a bit. And so the thing is, we talk about attachment and how your history affects your attachment. You're not set in stone. Like you can be a preoccupied like boss or, or director or a CEO but you can show up securely. And so important part is really to understand where, okay, this is my pattern and this is my anxiety, but then how do I show up securely? The hardest struggle is knowing what a secure supervisor looks like. What are those patterns? And so I, I think being aware of like your trigger points, what's going to trigger your attachment anxiety when you start experiencing that is know how to actually respond securely. So those are the steps, A, being aware of your attachment style, and then know, and knowing what a secure boss or secure follower or a secure supervisor he looks like in work shows up can be kind of would help you maybe be more effective as a leader. And I would imagine this is even more important in times of change, because, of course, change and uncertainty sends us backwards often. Uncertainty. Think about our climate today. Huh. <sighs> That we have the like a, we have like election happening, which can definitely affect like your business. The world changes so much. So Marshall Linehan, who's one of my favorite clinicians who like who developed DBT, she said the only constant is is change, which is uncertainty. And so you think about it, the only thing that's constant in our life is uncertainty. So then uncertainty is gonna trigger your attachment style and how you like how you deal with uncertainty. Why, though? Tell us why. Like, just bring us back. I mean, I think we all understand, but like, why does something at work say that there's, I'm worried there's pending layoffs, trigger an attachment style that could have been developed when I was 18 months old? Man, gosh, like, where do I start with that? It's such a deep, deep question. Like, 
you think about it, where, where, where does our attachment style start? It forms in our family system. And so if I grew up in a very chaotic, maybe had an alcoholic parent or very chaotic family where my parents were unpredictable, one minute they're like loving me, next minute they're like like yelling and screaming at me and being emotionally dysregulated or they might take off for a week. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is such an unpredictable environment. So then I'm like, I, I'm falling into that in, like preoccupied space, anxious attachment style. The only way I can control my environment is by is by leaning more into it. So I'm going to be really nice to you. I'm going to, I'm going to like, I'm going to try really hard to connect with you more because I don't want you to like leave me. And so I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to be like the best friend in the world. I'm going to respond to your texts. I want to make sure I send you flowers on your birthday. That's how I'm going to control my security. I'm going to work really, really hard and make you happy. If you're yes, my boss. I'm a high performer. I'm thinking about like what changes are going to be happening in the market way ahead of anybody else. I'm thinking like several steps ahead because I've got to control this because I'm not secure. And so even when business is going well, I'm waiting for the next shoe to drop in that. So I'm like thinking multiple steps ahead, which is my superpower, but also can be freaking emotionally exhausting. You write, connection is both the outcome and the intervention when it comes to your therapy and I guess also in healing our attachment styles, what do you mean by that? You think about the world we're in. The reason why we're having a crisis in mental health is because of disconnection. It's a lack of connection. And that's what's driving anxiety, depression, and high suicide rates. And so the outcome is, is helping people connect, having consistent, healthy connections. Also, the healing part of it is the connection that's the intervention is connecting, which is the outcome is connection. So it's both. And so the thing is, reality is that we're in a mental health crisis. I think we have to conceptualize the workspace is a way for people to get connected and to get their needs met. We used to be so opposed to the idea of like, no, you should not get your needs met at work. It, we can, we can get our needs met at work. We can have healthy connection and having healthy connection at work can actually make us a healthier person. And so I think it's okay to, to kind of like shatter that concept. And, and how do you, as an organization, how are you maintaining and building connections to help people feel connected? Because we're in such a disconnected world. I want us to pretend that we work in an ideal team where we can talk about things and we have a lot of psychological safety. And I'm the new boss. And I have a bunch of people working for me. And I know that I tend to have a little bit of an avoidant attachment style. How do I set this team up to work with me to get what they need? What do I say to them? I did think is first off, you're aware of your attachment style, which is so important. That's like like 50% of the process right now, being aware of like, hey, I'm avoidant, which means I probably going to have to stretch myself and get outside my comfort zone to actually meet the needs of my team. And so the reality is that you, you being avoidant means you're also a taskmaster. You probably thrive in structure. Okay. So you know that about yourself. So, okay, what I'm going to do is that I'm just not going to leave it up to chance for me to connect with my people. So I have to schedule it. I have to like make it a, like an intentional, a priority, and a part of my job. I think an avoided person is like, part of my job is connecting. It's part of my job. And so you, it's a role responsibility. It's on your job description. So as a taskmaster, as an avoided person, you want to kind of check your boxes and see it as like, this is important as maybe uh, doing the budget, whatever. It's this is important. So you schedule one-on-ones. I think the thing is that I'm really starting to learn more about one-on-ones, the value of one-on-ones and being consistent. I want, once again, I'm not good at this. I'm like, like the reason why I double down on this stuff, because I need it more than anybody else. And so I'm not, I'm not the expert in this. And so I'm practicing this. I'm hopefully getting better over gosh, 20 plus years here. And so I think things you got to like have structure to your one-on-ones. You've got to be consistent going on and it's got to be like a priority in your schedule. Yeah. What about anxious and anxious? I'm a preoccupied boss and I have someone on my team who is really high performing and also tends towards being pretty preoccupied and anxious. So two preoccupied people? Yeah. 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 I'm I'm very familiar with this dynamic. And what happens is that I'm actually learning through this process where 
you can go down that anxiety rabbit hole together. Oh, yeah. Like you can feed off each other. So a preoccupied person has a tendency to be an anxious person. Emotions drive the kind of like their process. And so they have a tendency to get emotionally reactive or dysregulated it pretty easy. So you have, to, you have a preoccupied boss. You have a preoccupied supervisor. So your preoccupied, anxious supervisor comes in your office. Oh, my gosh. It's, the chicken little, the sky is falling. Like we're, we're going to get shut down. Our business is going to close. And then, of course, that preoccupied person just jumps right into it. And then it's a party. It's a party. Yes. <laughs> it's a party. That's been my biggest struggle is not being an emotionally driven boss or a leader and being more regulated and being that stable force. That's my journey in this process. Like my double-edged sword is I'm highly driven. I'm highly looking at like threats in the future. I can predict things. I'm looking at the market. I'm wanting to be the best program I could possibly be. And that's my, my, that strength to that. But the, the other side of that is that I can get dysregulated and I can get then other people's anxiety makes me anxious. And then now we're fitting off each other versus being a stabilizing force, what a leader should be. And you have to have compassion for yourself too, right? You have to, as a leader, especially if you tend to be a little bit more anxious, have the compassion to say, if I start to fall into these old patterns, I need you to help me call me out on this, right? Or or have a partner. You know, for me, when I owned my business, I had a partner, my COO, Jen, who was everything I wasn't. I was always freaking out. I was, I'm so emotional. I'm so reactive. And she was like the one who's like, it's okay. Here's the spreadsheet. Here's the projection. <laughs> There's going to be other clients. You know, that sort of voice of reason. I feel like we we find our work spouses, our work partners who often, I think, help us regulate. And and maybe that is around the people who helped us. You you talk a lot about one of the things that you say that I really love is that to rebuild healthy attachment, it doesn't have to be someone who's going to be another parent figure who's going to be our, in our lives forever, that even short-term relationships can have a positive effect. We want to be secure. We want to be confident. We want to we want to have that like that peace in our life. And people who are in that secure space typically are in that spot. And so the way to get into that space is really like connecting with other secure people. So you can have that kind of anchor. I call them anchors too, like anchors. Mm. We all need anchors. Think about it, security, anchor. <laughs> like think about a yes. boat and like you know, it, it's creates security. So developing and finding anchors. And I have this, like, I don't know, somebody was looking out for me when I was a kid and I found those anchors with like, well, I, gosh, I get emotional about this in a heartbeat. Like, cause it's such a, such a impactful part of my life. I found a couple friends that I got connected and they were my anchors. They were my anchors through high school. They're my anchors through college. We text weekly. We, we do Ironman together. We go to concerts together. It's just like this anchor. And the thing is like finding those anchors and having that connection can help the healing. It can help you move out of that preoccupied space or that out of that disorganized space, having those connections. We can find those anchors at work and find those anchors with like a coach or a mentor or like, and I think, I think it's really helpful to hire like an executive coaches are great because they can be that anchor for you. I mean, that's the healing part, knowing what a secure person is or a leader and also building anchors is what's going to help you move or heal into that space. You say that there's a relationship between your attachment style and burnout. Yeah, like it's some some really fascinating research around attachment styles and job satisfaction. So think about the connection between job satisfaction and burnout. Directly correlate, like not even correlated, it's causal. People who are not satisfied in their job are going to feel burnout. And so so think about the different attachment styles we talked about today. Think about preoccupy, avoid and secure Who's going to be more satisfied in their job? Secure, right? Because they're feeling more secure, which means they're less likely to maybe misinterpret like failure or lack of performance or they're not doing well in their job. And so maybe a preoccupied person feels like they're not getting enough feedback, which means they're not feeling satisfied. And then when they're not feeling satisfied, they're feeling more emotionally dysregulated and then have that pattern of emotional dysregulation also leads to burnout. Also, that emotional dysregulation will lead to like like disconnection in the workplace, which also leads to burnout as well too in job satisfaction. Where and also an avoidant person, 
they might feel less need for a connection, but in reality, they really do need connection. So they're not feeling connected in the, in the workspace. So they might hop, do job hopping. People who are like anxious attachment style are preoccupied job hop a lot because they're not satisfied. They're moving on to greener pastures, like always what's better at the next job. The thing is to be aware of your pattern. So like, okay, is this really about me or is this really about the job? And so that's where like you put your little attachment lenses on and you're able to interpret what you're experiencing through that lens. Is it about me or is it about my boss or is it about the job? I know that you're a DBT teacher. I'm curious if you have any physical or grounding practices that, especially those of us who have preoccupied styles, but but any style can use when, when we're in that moment, when we're triggered and we're about to dive into that behavior and we really, you know, we, we, we want to, we don't want to, or, you know, something that you use to regulate yourself when that attachment lens comes on and says, beep, beep. Yeah, I think... What's so great about DBT is distress tolerance skills. I think there's four parts. This is one that most of us really focus on and the tip skills and and also to really understand sensory, like using sensory as a skill. And so you think about like we're in our body. Our whole body is about receiving and integrating senses, the sensory information. And so they really captivating our senses. And so like some of us are maybe dominant and different, like, like vision and like smell or touch and things like that too. And so really diving in of what, what you really connect with, what sense and using that as a way to kind of regulate. And so deep breathing is always something I, that's been really super helpful to like dysregulating is to maybe deep breathe. Also like sense of touch or like in my feet. And so I've been moments where I've like taken my shoes off and walked in the snow barefoot. I've done that with clients too, where like I'm getting dysregulated or I'm one of role model, like using your distress on skills to help regulate yourself, pulling your body in. The best way to turn the mind is to turn the body. Like it's so much easier to turn the body. And when you turn the body, you turn the mind. And so I found I'm feeling really anxious I'm going to go out and walk barefoot in snow or on the street or in the grass. And so I'm really turning my body to turn my mind to stop that loop. That's it for this episode of The Anxious Achiever. The show is produced and edited by Mary Dew with production support and sound engineering by Nick Krinko. If you like what you heard, head to your favorite podcast app. Leave us a review. It really matters and we appreciate the time and effort it takes. And if you don't subscribe or follow the show already, now's the time. And let us know what you'd like to hear more of. I get some of my best ideas from my listeners, so find me on LinkedIn, send me a message. You could find my weekly newsletter there as well. A big thanks to LinkedIn and all the listeners out there and our guests in the anxious achiever world. Until next time.